haircut. My husband and I are gonna buy new bedroom furniture. And the rest of the time, um, oh wait, Monday I'm going to Illinois to see my aunt who I haven't seen in literally so long because of COVID and stuff and I'm really excited to see her. And um, that's about it. Other than that, I plan on sleeping. I plan on hanging out with my doggies. So that's about it. All right, thank you for asking. Oh, that's fun, Eden. All right, we're gonna try to read about two paragraphs today. Remember, Sal got another crazy note. Not Sal, but um, Phoebe's family got another crazy note. And, you know, crazy times. We are reading 12, The Marriage Bed. Page 70. When I had first started telling Phoebe's story, Graham and Graham sat quietly and listened. Grams concentrated on the road, and Grams grazed out the window occasionally and interjected a gall bang or a no kidding. But as I got further into the story, they began to interrupt more and more. When I told them about the message, everybody has his own agenda, Grams thumped on the dashboard and said, isn't that the truth? Lordy, isn't that what it's all about? I said, how do you mean? Everybody's just walking along, concerned with his own problems, his own life, his own worries, and we're all accepting other people to expect other people to tune into our own agenda. Look at my worry, worry with me, step into my life, care about my problems, care about me, Graham sighed. Graham snatched, scratched his head. You're turning into a philosopher or something. Mind your own agenda, she said. Hey, everyone, can we please stop typing in the chat now? Stop typing in the chat. We should be listening to the story. When I mentioned about Ben asking where my mother was and saying that she was in Lewiston, but I didn't want to elaborate, Graham and Gramps looked at each other. Gramps said, one time my father took off for six months and didn't tell us a soul where he was going. When my best friend asked me where my father was, I hauled off and punched him in the jaw. My best friend, I punched him in the dang jaw. You never told me that, Graham said. I hope he socked you back. Gramps pointed at the gap in his teeth. See that? He knocked my tooth dang out. When I told Graham and Gramps about flinching when Ben touched me and about how I went home and found Dad in the garage, Graham unbuckled her seatbelt, turned all the way around, and leaned over the back of her seat. She took my hand and kissed it. Gramps said, give her one for me, too. So Gramps kissed my hand again. Several times when I described Phoebe's world of lunatics and axe murderers, Graham said, just like Gloria, I swear to goodness, just exactly like Gloria. Once after she said this, Graham's got a dreamy look on his face and Graham said, quit that mooning over Gloria. I know what you're thinking. Graham said, hear that chickabitty? This here gooseberry knows everything that runs through my head. Isn't she something? Just before we reached South Dakota border, Gramps took a detour north because he had seen a sign advertising a Pipestone National Monument of Pipestone, Minnesota. On the sign was a picture of an Indian smoking a pipe. What do you want to go see an old Indian smoking a pipe for, Graham asked. She didn't like the term Native American any more than my mother did. I just do, Graham said. We might not ever get a chance again to see an Indian smoking a pipe, Graham said. Will it take very long, I asked. I asked as the air screamed, hurry, hurry, hurry. Not too long, Chickabitty. We got to cool off our car busterators. These roads are taking the poop out of me. The detour to Pipestone wound through a cool, dark forest. And if you closed your eyes and smelled the air, you could smell by Banks, Kentucky. Pipestone was a small town. Everywhere we went, people were talking to each other, standing there talking, or sitting on a bench talking, or walking along the street talking. When we passed by, they looked up at us right in our faces and said, hi, or howdy. And although it sounds corny to say, we felt right at home there. It was so like by Banks, where everyone you see stops to say something because they know you and have have known you their whole lives. We went to Pipestone National Monument and saw Indians thunking away at a stone in a quarry. I asked one if he was a Native American, but he said, no, I'm a person. I said, but are you a Native American person? He said, no, I'm an American Indian person. I said, so am I, in my blood. We watched other Native Indian persons making pipes out of stone. In the Pipe Museum, we learned about pipes 
we learned more about pipes than any, any human being ought to know. In a little clearing outside the museum, an Indian person was sitting on a tree stump smoking a long peace pipe. After watching him for about five minutes, Gramps asked if he could try. The man passed Gramps the pipe, and Gramps, Gramps sat down on the grass, took two puffs, and passed it to Gram. She didn't even blink. She took two puffs and passed it to me. There was a sweet, sticky taste on the end of the pipe. With the stem in my mouth, I gave two, it two little kisses, which is what it looked like Graham and Gramps had done. The smoke came into my mouth, and I held it there while I passed the pipe back. I held that smoke in my mouth while Graham and Gramps puffed some more. I was feeling slightly wang-doodled. I opened my mouth a wee bit, and a tiny stream of smoke curled out into the air. And when I saw that, for some reason, I was reminded of my mother. It didn't make any sense, but my brain was saying, there goes your mother. And I watched the trail of smoke disappear into the air. In a shop attached to the pipe museum, Gramps bought a bought two peace pipes. One was for him and the other was for me. It's not for smoking with, he said. It's for remembering with. Yeah, obviously we can't. You guys shouldn't be smoking. <clears throat> you know, people let their kids do weird things. But anyways, that's not the main part. The whole part is that, you know, with the Indians and the peace pipes and stuff, there that's, you know, that's what the whole thing this whole thing is about, not the fact that they were smoking. That night we stayed in In June's Joe Peace Palace Motel. On the sign of the law, but he, somebody had crossed out In June and written Native American. On the whole sign, Native American. So the whole sign read Native American Joe's Peace Palace Motel. In our room, in June Joe's, embroidered on the towels, had been changed with black marker to Indian Joe's. I wish everybody would just make up their mind. By now, I was used to staying in a room with Graham and Gramps. Every night when they climbed into bed, they lay right beside each other. And on their backs, Graham said every single night, well, this ain't our marriage bed, but it'll do. Probably the most precious thing in the whole world to Gramps, besides Graham, was their marriage bed. This is what they call their bed back home in Bybanks, Kentucky's. One of the stories that Gramps liked to tell was about he and all his brothers had been born in that bed, and all Graham and Gramps' own children had been born in that same bed. So it's like family bed. So the mattress, probably not that great anymore, but that's besides the point. Well, Gramps tells this story... He starts with when he was 17 years old, living with his parents in Bybank. That's when he met Graham. She was visiting her aunt who lived over the meadow from where Gramps lived. I was a wild thing then, Graham said, and I didn't stand still for any girl. I could tell you that. They had to try to catch Gramps on the run, but when he saw Graham running in the meadow with her long hair as silky as a filly's, he was the one who was trying to do the catching. Talk about wild things. Your grandmother was the wildest, most untamed, most ornery and beautiful creature ever to grace this earth. Graham said he followed her like a sick old dog for 22 days. And on the 23rd day, he marched up to her father and asked if he could marry her. Her father said, if you can get her to stand still long enough, and if she'll have you, I guess you can. When Gramps asked Graham to marry him, she said, do you have a dog? Gramps said that, yes, as a matter of fact, he had a fat old beagle named Sadie. Gramps said, where does she sleep? Gramps stumbled around her bit and said, to tell you the truth, she sleeps right next to me. But if we get married, I, and when you come in the door at night, Gramps said, what does the dog do? Gramps couldn't figure out what she was getting at, so he just told the truth. She jumps all over me, licking and howling. And then what do you do? Gramps said, well, gosh, Gramps said. He did not like to admit it. But he said, I take her in my lap and pet her till she calms down, and sometimes I sing her a song. You're making me feel foolish. I don't mean to, she said. You've told me all I need to know. I figure if you treat a dog that good, you'll treat me better. I figured if that old beagle Sadie loves you so much, I'll probably love you better. Yes, I'll marry you. Obviously. <laughs> you know. Well, this is a long time ago. Remember, they're old and, you know, dating was different back in the day. Obviously, you know, you had to, like, ask parents permission. And, you know, they didn't even really get to know each other before he asked if he could marry her. And she's like, oh, well, you're nice to your dog. Obviously, you're going to be nice to me. You know, weird. But, hey. 
apparently, you know, they're in love because of that. They were married three months later. During that time between his proposal and their wedding day, Gramps and his father and brothers built a small house in a clearing behind the first meadow. We didn't have time, Gramps said, to completely finish it, and there wasn't a single stick of furniture in it yet, but that didn't matter. We were going to sleep there on our wedding night all the same. They were married in Aspen Grove on a clear July day, and after were they and all their friends and relatives had a wedding supper on the banks of the river. During the subs, Gramps noticed that his father and two brothers were absent. He thought maybe they were planning a, a wet cheer, which is when the men kidnap the groom for an hour or so, and they all go out in the woods and share a bottle of whiskey. Before the end of his supper, his father and brothers came back, but they did not kidnap him for a wet cheer. Gramps was just as glad, he said, because he needed his wits about him that evening. At the end of the supper, Gramps picked up Gramps in his arms and carried her across the meadow. Behind them, everyone was singing, Oh, meet me in the tulips when the tulips do bloom. This is what they always sing at weddings when the married couple leaves. It is supposed to be a joke, as if Graham and Grams were going away by themselves and might not reappear until the following spring when the tulips were in bloom. Gramps carried Graham all the way across the meadow and through the trees and into the clearing where their little house stood. He carried her through the door and took one look around and started to cry. Yeah, can we please stop typing in the chat? Because no one, like you guys aren't paying attention. Okay, I don't necessarily think the book is weird. Once again, this is like, a, this happened a long time ago. Weddings were different when Graham and Grams got married when they were 17 years old. It's all really different. Tulips are flowers, so they're saying, you know, like a tulip field. And it literally just explained it was supposed to be a joke that, you know, is as if once you get married, you're never going to return until next spring. The reason Gramps cried when he carried Graham into the house was there. In the center of the bedroom stood his own parents bed, the bed that Gramps and each of his brothers had been born in, the bed his parents had always slept in. This is where his father and brothers had disappeared to during the wedding supper. They had been moving the bed into Graham and Gramps' new house. At the foot of the bed, wiggling and slurping with Sadie, Gramps' old dog. Gramps always ended the story saying, that his bed has been around my entire life, and I'm going to die in that bed. And that bed will know everything there is to know about me. So each night on our trip out to Idaho, Gramps pats the bed in the motel and said, well, this ain't our marriage bed, but it'll do. While I lay in the bed... While well, I lay in the next bed wondering if I if I would ever have a marriage bed like theirs. So people also got married at younger ages a long time ago. Another thing from a long time ago. So the marriage bed is really just a symbol of how much Graham and Gramps cared about care about each other. And Gramps is saying, like, even though this isn't our home where we're sleeping, it's fine because I'm with you, is what he's saying. You know, this isn't where we've always slept, and it's not our home, our home bed, that we're with each other. It's okay that we're in a motel. And we are going to leave, uh, finish. In I'm going to start reading chapter 13. It was time to tell Graham and Gramps about Mr. Berkway. Mr. Berkway was mighty strange. I don't know what to make of him. I didn't know what to make of him. I thought he might have a few squirrels in the attic of his brain. Ah, a few squirrels in the attic. Funny. What? Wait, what? What, Paisley? Friends, can we please stop typing in the chat? People used to get married really young. People still get married really young, and that's fine, okay? Totally fine. I just stopped for a second because I was trying to figure out where I wanted it to start. I, I Apparently, that's what Michaela said. We're not talking about Michaela's grandma right now. Thank you for sharing, Michaela. People used to get married young. It's fine. Anyways, we're going to learn about Mr. Berkway. He was one of those energetic teachers who loved his subject half to death and leaped about the room dramatically, waving his arms and clutching his chest and walking people on the back. He said brilliant and wonderful and terrific. He was tall and slim 
and his bushy black hair made him look wild. But he had enormous, deep brown, cow-like eyes that sparkled all over the place. And when he turned those eyes on you, you felt as if you were his whole purpose in life was to stand there and listen to you and you alone. Midway through the first class, Mr. Berkway asked everyone asked for everyone's summer journals. He flung himself up and down the aisles, receiving the journals as if they were man in from heaven. Wonderful, he said to each journal giver. I was worried. I had no journal. Mary Lou Finney's desk were six journals. Six, Mr. Berkway said. Heaven's mercy, is it? Can it be Shakespeare? He counted the journal. Six. Brilliant. Magnificent. Christy and Megan, two other girls, had their own club called the GGP, whatever that meant, were whispering over on the other side of the room and casting malevolent looks in Mary Lou's direction. Mary Lou kept her hands on top of the journals as Mr. Berkeley reached for them. In a low voice, she said, I don't want you to read them. What? Mr. Berkeley boomed. Not read them? The whole class was silent. Mr. Berkeley scooped up Mary Lou's journals before she could even blink. He said, don't be silly. Brilliant. Thank you. Another girl, Beth Ann, looked as if she might cry. Phoebe was sending me messages with her eyebrows that indicated that she was not too pleased either. I think they were all hoping that Mr. Berkeley was now actually going to read these journals. Mr. Berkeley went around the room, snatching journals. Alex Chesapeake's journal was covered with basketball stickers. Christy and Megan's were slathered over slathered over with pictures of male models. The cover of Ben's was a cartoon of a boy with a normal boy's head, but the arms and legs with per were pencils, and out of the tips of his hands were feet were dribbles of words. When he got to Phoebe's desk, Mr. Berkeley lifted up her plain journal and peeked inside. Phoebe was trying to slide down in her chair. I didn't write much, Phoebe said. In fact, I can hardly remember what I wrote about at all. By the time Mr. Berkeley got to me, my heart was clobbering around so hard I thought it might leap straight out of my chest. Deprived child, he said. You didn't have a chance to write a journal. I'm new. New? How blessed, he said. There's nothing in this whole world that is better than a new person. So I didn't know about the journals. Not to worry, Mr. Berkeley said. I'll think of something. I wasn't sure what that meant. I thought maybe he would give me a whole lot of extra homework or something. For the rest of the day, you could see little groups of people asking each other, did you write about me? I was very glad I hadn't written anything. For a while, we didn't hear any more about the journals. We had absolutely no idea all the trouble they were going to cause. So these students in her class over the summer, they wrote in journals. Well, obviously Sal couldn't do that because she's new to the school. So how would she know that she was supposed to do that over the summer? So she got out of this long summer project and all the kids didn't know the teacher was actually going to read these journals and later we're going to find out about what they write about and uh it's pretty funny later the rhododendra on saturday i was at phoebe's again her father was golfing and her mother was running errands mrs winterbottom had read out a long list to us of where she was going in case we needed her if we heard any noises at all we were supposed to call the police immediately once again mrs winterbottom worry person <clears throat> Mrs. Winterbottom said, call Mrs. Cadaver. I think she's home today. I'm sure she would come right over. Oh, sure, Phoebe whispered to me. That's about the last person I would call. Phoebe imagined that every noise was a lunatic sneaking in or the message lever creeping up to drop off another anonymous note. She was so jumpy that I began to feel uneasy too. That can happen when you're like spending a time with a person that even if they're not like crazy like Phoebe, but just any type of person that their emotions can like kind of transfer to you and then you start feeling how they're feeling. After her mother left, Phoebe said, Mrs. Cadaver works odd hours, doesn't she? Sometimes she works every night of the week, straggling home when most people are waking up, but sometimes she works during the day. She's a nurse, so I guess she works different shifts, I said. That day, Mrs. Cadaver was home, puttering around her garden. We saw her from Phoebe's bedroom window. Actually, puttering is not the best word. What she was doing was more like slogging and slashing. Mrs. Cadaver hacked branches off the trees and hauled these to the back of her lot where she lumped into a pile of branches that she had hacked off last week. I told you she was strong as an ox, Phoebe said. Next, Mrs. Cadaver slashed and sliced at a pitiful rose bush that had been trying to creep up the side of her house. Then she shred off the tops of the hedge that borders Phoebe's yard. She moved to the rhododendron bush, which she was poking and prodding when a car pulled into her driveway. A tall man with bushy black hair leafed out, and seeing her, he practically skipped back to where she was. They hugged each other. Oh, no, Phoebe said. The man with the bushy black hair was Mr. Berkway, our English teacher. Oh, 
I'm like, well, that's weird. I'm like, why, why are they hanging out? Mrs. Cadaver pointed to the rhododendron bush and then at the axe, but Mr. Berkway shook his head. He disappeared into the garage and returned with two shovels. Then he and Mrs. Cadaver gorged and prodded and tunneled around in the dirt until the poor old rhododendron flopped onto its side. They lugged the bush to the opposite side of the yard where there was a mound of dirt. And they replanted the bush. Maybe there's something hidden under the bush, Phoebe said. Like what? Like Mr. Cadaver, as I told you before. Maybe Mr. Mr. Berkeley helped her chop up her husband and bury him, and maybe they were getting worried and decided to disguise the pot, spot with the rhododendron bush. I must have looked skeptical, Phoebe said. I must have looked skeptical. Phoebe said, Sal, you, I, you never can tell. And Sal, I don't think you and your father should go over there anymore. Okay, so Sal's now deciding that, or I mean, Phoebe's now deciding that Sal and her father should not hang out with Mrs. Cadaver. Like, nope, nope, I think she's dangerous. Don't go over there. Like, Sal doesn't have any say in what her father's doing. I certainly agreed with her on that. Dad and I had been there two nights earlier, and I hardly been able to sit still. I started noticing all those frightening things in Margaret's house. Creepy masks, old sword, books with titles like The Murderers in the Rogue Morgue and Skull and the Hatchet. Margaret cornered me in the kitchen and said, So... What has your father told you about me? Nothing, I said. Oh, she seemed disappointed. My father's behavior was always different at Margaret's. At home, I would sometimes find him sitting on his bed, staring at the floor, or reading through old letters, or gazing in at the photo album. He looked sad and lonely, but at Margaret's, he would smile, and sometimes even laugh. And once, she touched his hand, and he let her hand rest there on top of his. I didn't like it. I didn't want my father to be sad, but at least when he was sad, I knew he was remembering my mother. So, when Phoebe suggested that my father and I should not go to Margaret's, I was quite willing to agree with that notion. So, remember, we don't really know what happened to Sal's mother. We know she left, but then they said resting in the beginning of the book, which made us think she was dead. But then we, I also feel like maybe they, she just left and they're, like, getting a divorce or something. And anyways, he's really sad. Dad's really sad all the time, except for when he hangs out with Margaret and she touched his hand. And, oh, snap, like, are they, are they like, boyfriend-girlfriend? Like, we don't know. When Phoebe's mother came home, from running all her errands, she looked terrible. She was sniffling and blowing her nose. Phoebe said she was going to do our homework. Upstairs, I said, maybe we should have helped her put the groceries away. She likes to do it all by herself, Phoebe said. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure, Phoebe said. I've lived with her my whole life, haven't I? She looks as if she'd been crying. Maybe something's wrong. Maybe something is bothering her. Don't you think she would have said so then? Maybe she's afraid to. I said, I wondered why it was so easy for me to see that Phoebe's mother was worried and miserable, but Phoebe couldn't see it. Or if she could, she was ignoring it. Maybe she didn't want to notice. Maybe she was too frightened. Maybe it was too frightening of a thing. I wondered if this is how it had been with my mother. Were there things I didn't notice? Later that afternoon, when Phoebe and I went downstairs, Mrs. Winterbottom was talking with Prudence. Do you think I lead a tiny life? She asked. How do you mean? Prudence said as she filed her nails. Do we have any nail polish remover? Phoebe's mother retrieved a bottle of nail polish remover from the bathroom. Oh, Prudence said, before I forget, do you think you could sew up the hem of my brown skirt so I could wear it tomorrow? Oh, please. Prudence tilted her head with the side, tugged at her hair in exactly the same way Phoebe does, and smoothed, smooshed up her mouth into a pouty, into a little pout. Doesn't Prudence know how to sew, I asked. Well, of course she does, Phoebe said. Why? I was just wondering why she doesn't sew her own skirt. Sal, you're becoming very critical. Before I left Phoebe's that day, Mrs. Winterbottom handed Prudence her brown skirt with a newly sewn hem. All the way home, I wondered about Mrs. Winterbottom and what she meant about living a tiny life. If she didn't like all that baking and cleaning and jumping up to get bottles of nail polish remover and sewing hems, why did she do it? Why didn't she tell them to do some of those things themselves? Maybe she was afraid there would be nothing left for her to do. There would be no need for her and she would become invisible and no one would notice. When I got home that day, my father handed me a package. It's from Margaret, he said. What is it? I don't know. Why don't you open it? Inside it was a blue sweater. I put it back in the box and went upstairs. My father followed me. Sal, Sal, do you like it? I don't want it, I said. She's just trying to. She likes you. I don't care if she likes me or not, I said. My father stood there looking around the room. I want to tell you something about Margaret, he said. Well, I don't want to hear it. I was feeling so completely honory. My father left the room. I could still hear my own voice saying, I don't want to hear it. I sounded exactly like Phoebe. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, so we are going to stop there for a while because we're not going to pick this up till we come back from spring break. But once again, 
I feel like Phoebe and Sal's relationship's a little bit silly sometimes. I just don't know. Like, Phoebe just seems like an interesting person. I definitely, and I hope you guys can see too, that Mrs. Winterbottom, Phoebe's mom, definitely does not seem happy. Mrs. Cadaver still seems a little bit suspicious, but we don't really know why. Like, is she suspicious because of the things she's doing, or like chopping up trees, or is she suspicious just because Phoebe tells us that, like, oh, snap. She's, you know, we should be suspicious of her. So, um, why do you keep on saying bless you, Hannah? Anyways, we will pick up later. And um, the next chapter is actually really good. So, oh, well, I couldn't see you, excuse me. Okay, well, bless you too. Hannah, if they're in your classroom, just say it to them. You don't have to type it in the thing. But this will be posted, of course. I'll see you guys in Math RTI or reading. Ta-ta for now.